hope everybody's still got some energy. Last talk before the break. Um, yeah, so as Peter said, my name is Zach Van Scowen, and I'm the VP of Engineering at Carrot, and I'm here to talk about engineering the technical interview. So um, basically, I'll do the carrot pitch real quick and get it out of the way. At most companies, making interviews better isn't really anybody's job, so at Carrot, we made it our job. Um, before my current role, I was working as the technical lead for Google Forms. And in that role, I had done a few hundred technical interviews for Google. Uh, at the time, I thought those were pretty good interviews. I thought I had a pretty good handle on what made them work. I had some questions I liked, and I thought I was a good judge of talent. Flash forward, uh, I got involved with Carrot as an interview engineer. So as a dedicated professional working from my home, I did a 1,300 interviews. Uh, it was, yeah. So in that time, um, <laughs> I've become aware just how much better you can actually make interviews. So the question I want to talk about today is sort of how can engineers innovate in a part of our business that we usually just treat as a barrier to entry? Uh, can we treat interviewing like we would any other engineering discipline and actually optimize the output? So uh, before we optimize, we obviously need a North Star. So uh, just a few characteristics that make an interview question fundamentally good. So one of those is that it's predictive, which is that it tells you how someone's going to perform on the job. Uh, it also needs to be sensitive, meaning it produces a distribution of outcomes that lets you make a meaningful distinction between candidates in your pool. It's balanced, meaning that if two candidates have the same skill level, you'd expect the same outcome. And finally, it's objective, which says that the criteria you use, that you're using to evaluate the interview are unambiguous, and there's no opportunity for the interviewer to fudge or introduce their own subjective bias into the scoring. So in the next few minutes, I'll touch on each of these points to talk about how you can increase the rigor of each step of the process and ensure you're moving toward all four of those goals. So the first step of developing an interview loop is what at Carrot we refer to as job analysis. So that means that for every job that you hire for, there's someone who is dedicated to reviewing the job description, the responsibilities, and any assessments that are already in place for that role. The output of that process ultimately should be a list of competencies that are predictive of success on the job. For a typical engineering role, that might include basic coding, algorithms, collaboration, debugging, talking through code, and so on. Uh, after the job analysis, you want to be in a situation where each portion of your assessment is ultimately mapping to one competency. Having that formal competency framework makes it possible to interrogate how well each part of the assessment is actually working. Uh, most interview questions are trying to measure a few things at once, like can this person code quickly? Can they talk out loud? Did they grow up playing the same board games as you? Can they speed read four paragraphs of text in English while you're staring at them? Uh, <laughs> earlier in my career, I had a 45-minute interview, and I sat down, and they handed me a four-page packet. Uh, and I was expected to read it, produce a spec, and work in code for that spec by the end of the meeting. Uh, hopefully, that's not how they did things on the job. I don't know. I didn't get it. Um, <laughs> So it's clear you need to explicitly state, like to the interviewer and candidate, like what you're trying to measure and how. So you know, just a few simple examples. Are you expecting complete code, or are you just expecting an outline or pseudocode? Is the quality of the code going to be a factor in your evaluation? Should they write a brute force solution? Should they optimize? Do you care about this? When should they start? All of these things are kind of subtly hidden in the background of the interview. Uh, another factor is just that interviewing is really expensive in terms of both personnel costs and opportunity costs. Every minute you spend with a candidate is really valuable. Uh, repeatedly measuring the same thing, which is a very common practice, such as by conducting three coding interviews on the same loop, is a great way to bring false negatives into your process, but almost never increases the signal of the interview loop. You could imagine if I sat down with you and asked you to write a breadth first search, you wrote it front to back, then I asked you to write binary search and you failed, you're probably a competent programmer. However, that's not the result that's produced by most interview processes today. Once someone has demonstrated a skill, you want to move on, and if you're confident in the accuracy of your assessment, you should be confident making that judgment with a single measurement. Once you're at the point of measuring each skill that's crucial using a discrete separate assessment, you're increasing the value of each part of the interview and making it possible to optimize them atomically. So if you, just to give one example, if you'd like to see a candidate test their code, don't add that to your coding exercise. Don't have an implicit exercise of testing their code. Show them a piece of code and ask them how they test it. This sounds straightforward, but by limiting the input space of that problem, you also limit the possible outputs and make the grading more fair. Uh, so once you've settled on what you're measuring and how, you can start to do that performance optimization that I'm talking about. So what are a few ways you could go about it? First, adding structure to your interview questions. This is one reliable way to increase the signal that they produce while reducing oops, pardon me, the opportunity to introduce bias. So a common interview question format goes, take a system, it's usually tiny URL or bit.ly, and draw a diagram of it on the board. Uh, I've probably had this question 10, 15 times in an interview. Uh, the question to ask here is, what candidates are actually going to struggle with that question? Do the candidates in the room actually understand the definitions of the boxes and lines in a typical engineering interview? Do they know your expectations? Are the candidates who fail on that exercise actually lacking a system design competency? If a candidate from a non-traditional background did have that competency, are you confident your assessment would capture that? Uh, 
another typical uh, characteristic of questions like this is what I would call built-in ambiguity. Uh, the engineer gives you some unclear requirements and you're expected to tease them out. This is a great way for finding assertive candidates, and this is a great way to find candidates who are already members of an in-group you have on staff, but assertiveness is probably not the skill you're selecting for. Uh, so at a minimum, just telling a candidate to prepare for ambiguity and laying out your expectations should, in my opinion, be totally mandatory. Um, at Carrot, our preferred methodology to do system design or whiteboard questions is instead to propose a simple, concrete system with predictable characteristics, then ask the candidate to criticize its performance in specific situations and propose improvements. By doing this, the expectations are clear, but the space of possible outcomes is tightly constrained. So uh, let's get a little more concrete. Here is a seemingly ordinary two-part interview question. We start with a simple question, we escalate to something that's a little harder. In the introductory question, we ask a candidate, what's the most common letter in this sentence? For the second question, we give them another sentence and ask them for the most common letter in the first sentence that isn't in the second sentence. So here I've illustrated two potential solutions. I won't go too deep down this road, but these have roughly equal merit uh, when solving a basic engineering problem, and there's no particularly compelling reason that you would choose one solution over the other. However, when you get to question two, if you wrote question, excuse me, if you chose solution B on the first question, you've got half the problem done already. So that's an involuntary choice, and while this example may seem contrived, I have looked at a lot of multi-part coding questions, and almost inevitably, the output of the first part can influence the performance of the second part in undesirable ways. Typically, what we recommend here is coming up with questions that are thematically linked, but ultimately don't rely on interconnected steps. So here's the fun one. Uh, the most common problem with interviews from the manager's point of view is that they're a black box. You have really no idea what goes on once the door of that room closes. You only have an unreliable narrator's report. So how do you ensure your interview is as high quality as any other piece of engineering output? So um, I have an edge answering this question because I have recorded and audited about 50,000 interviews. So uh, I can tell you that when you put all of those interviews through a quality control process, one statistical conclusion that emerges is that interviewers get better over time. Uh, we actually define an error rate, which would, for example, mean giving a hint too soon, explaining a question unclearly, or just being awkward with the candidate. All of those go down over time as someone performs, and in particular, it goes down with the frequency they interview to, not just their total count. This is just sort of a speaking point to what we can do with continuous training and mentoring. Uh, we've also found that it's important to evaluate each interviewer directly. They need to be capable technical evaluators, but they also need to have a good bedside manner and to adhere to the guidelines you've set out for them. Uh, a big part of that is giving guidance consistently. So having conducted 1,600 or so interviews, I can tell you a carefully delivered hint can skew a candidate's performance and can be totally undetectable from the manager's point of view. One thing that's crucial in the interview is to provide clear, unambiguous guardrails to all the interviewers and enforce that they're staying within them. Uh, and also to this point, one thing we found success with is Carrot is allowing candidates to redo their interview. So they get a chance to learn the format and the expectations, then come back, get a new interviewer, a new question, and another attempt to uh, give their best performance. An interesting fact we found is that that sourcing channel is just as efficient as the first interview, which is to say your odds of being hired from your first interview are the same as from your redo. So, now that we've ensured the interview is being administered in a consistent manner, how do we bring that consistency to the output of the interview? Um, just to be anecdotal, I conducted interviews at one company where there were 40 possible grades between yes and no, and the only distinctions between them were subjective. So uh, what that company came up with is they aggregated the performance data for every interviewer into a histogram and compared them side by side. This is not a pattern. Um, <laughs> so on this slide, I give a sample of the structured scoring Carrot uses for our own interviews. And I don't want to say this is the end-all be-all, to be honest, but just having any rubric in place is a sea change over the typical interview. Some of the categories we incorporate in our scoring are the optimality of their solution, how far they got toward that solution, how many hints we gave and what kind, and how much debugging they did. These categories look pretty simple on a slide, but each of them is backed by a long, complex, rigorous definition that we can audit and defend. When I see someone got a moderate hint, I know exactly what happened, I know when that hint should have been given, and I know how, how severe it should have been. Once you've defined like rigorous scoring standards, you can look critically at the next step in your pipeline. What is the necessary performance for success in the interview, and is that uniform across your interviewers? How do you derive a decision from that output? Much like the interview, the roundtable, the debrief, the hiring committee, those are typically opaque processes. Uh, documenting the conclusions that were reached and the standards by which you reach them to make them repeatable is crucial if you're going to have any meaningful critical inquiry about the way that you hire. So many companies, and I know no one here does this, but many companies have blindly copied interviewing practices that have been around since the late 90s. They overemphasize hard algorithms, writing code quickly, 
Uh, doing the type of analysis we portray in this sample is really valuable. We say, what happens to the candidates that you rejected? If you find that your peer companies are snapping them up, or worse, companies you consider higher bar than you, you might be optimizing for the wrong signals in the interview process and creating false negatives. There's not a lot of areas of your business where you would ignore the value of structured data. Once you've built this structured interview feedback, you can optimize in ways that your competitors cannot. Of course, that's assuming your data enables any meaningful analysis at all. So here I've included a few pathological examples of things we've seen in our clients' applicant tracking systems. Uh, one data point I like to throw around is a typical error rate would be 40% in the applicant tracking system. Uh, the client on left probably doesn't have 20 different states you go through before getting hired, but it does appear that way. Similarly, this is a great example of a real record of someone who appears to have been rejected, but in fact chose not to proceed with the interview loop. If you're looking at these statistics in aggregate, you'll find the data is often a lot worse than you're imagining. We highly recommend bringing someone in to just clean this up for you. So, oops, pardon me. So uh, another talk about the power of structured data. In the analysis you see here, we looked at about 5,500 candidates who had all answered the same two-part coding question. Uh, and we found, of the candidates who finished the first part in under 10 minutes, there was a 99% chance they would go on to pass the rest of the interview. Uh, what that tells us is that the interview format we had been applying here was not capturing as much signal per minute as was possible. Um, this kind of meme is the foundation of what at Carrot we refer to as adaptive interviewing. It's the question of when you can understand that someone has demonstrated a competency and move on immediately to the next most valuable competency. So I'd like to wrap up with a few takeaways that you can ultimately bring back and apply to your own processes. Uh, first is just giving interviewing an owner. By assigning an engineer to own each section of the interview, you create accountability where it does not exist today, and you create someone whose job it is to produce consistency. Centralizing interviewing and training in a single program. Most companies have some kind of interviewer training. In my experience, it usually consists of being told not to break the law and being pushed out of the nest. So um, <laughs> we recommend that you don't just train people on interviewing, but also on the specific questions they're asking. At Carrot, for example, we ask people to know every possible solution to a coding question, its relative merits, and the most common pitfalls when encountering it. We ask people to complete the whole problem front to back themselves, uh, and we evaluate that performance using a check. That's really valuable. I cannot count the number of times I walked into a professional interview having never seen the question I was about to ask and not really understanding it on a deep level. I'm not the only one who's guilty. No need to raise your hand. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's crucial to train not only on the questions, but also on the rubrics. Uh, after that, find a way to audit your interviews. So I have an edge on this because we're recording everything. But uh, even if you don't want to record your interviews, and I understand that, you can use shadows, you can use spot checks, you can use metadata, and ultimately you can ask interviewers to self-evaluate their performance. Uh, by doing this, you can give meaningful feedback to non-predictive interviewers or those who ignore your structure. Similarly, you also gain the power to re-examine your questions, how they perform in the wild, and discard the ones that are low performers quickly. Finally, build your process for data collection from day one. If you build structure into the process from the ground floor, you can optimize, react quickly, and ultimately reduce the time you waste on unproductive interviews and interviewing the wrong candidates. A typical pool will have maybe 5,000 pieces of interview feedback, but it's very difficult to act on that. Even the most basic structure can really empower your hiring process. And with that, I will walk into questions.